Hello, everyone. I'm Vaila Lee, your Tai Chi examiner. And uh, today, and um, um, I, I'm really looking forward to it because I'm going to uh, talk to my friend and uh, Sifu Stephen Watson. And uh, Stephen is such a fun person and with uh, a great um, knowledge, and uh, especially in the philosophy area. And uh, Stephen has been uh, learning and uh, practicing um, Tai Chi and Qigong, Ba Gua, Xing Yi, and so forth, and also teaching for 30 some years. And uh, he's a very well, um, how should I say, very, very experienced and uh, well liked mm -hmm. and respected uh, in the community. So um, uh, let's you. say hi to 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 Stephen and also <laughs> Stephen, you can say hi to everyone. <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, okay, what's he, its name? That's a this sloth. Is, uh, this is Sloffy. Yeah, and he uh, Sloffy encourages slow moving, just like Tai Chi Chuan and Qigong. So it's a very very nice mascot for reminding us slowness is the secret sauce to Tai Chi Chuan. Very good, very good. I, I know there's one uh, actress, she's uh, really, uh, how should I say, crazy about uh, sloths and uh, oh, what's her name? It's oh, actually about my time. I, I, I cannot remember, but once I remember, I send it to you. Please. And uh, the, there are so many, um, how should I say, topic and I can tap uh, into Stephen's brain because he, he just has a lot of, to share. But today, and uh, um, there's a special topic, and I like to to talk to him uh, about. And uh, in late and uh, all September about 2022, uh, very uh, unfortunate, and um, uh, Stephen was diagnosed with cancer, and uh, he has gone through chemotherapy and uh, surgeries and so forth, and. Um, and now at one point he was hospitalized for three weeks. And then today I'm very happy to see him uh, here and uh, um, you know, uh, looking even better than me, right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and um, so, so uh, I, I would like to just um, uh, talk to him about his journey and then how he, he deal with uh, the cancer, and um, so um, first of all, uh, do you mind to talk about what kind of cancer are you? You know, you, you definitely don't have to answer all my questions. That's for sure. Yeah, I'm ha I'm happy to. Yeah, so it was um, cancer of the colon, and uh, and it had metastasized, so it was in a few places. But the, I guess they still call it colon cancer, and that's the primary tumor. I think is the way they describe it. Yeah. I see. Yeah, well, I, I can uh, imagine it, it probably very painful also. And mm. uh, so how how did you discover? Because uh, um, I, I guess one time we talk about uh, you and I, we don't really see doctors, right? And then it, yeah. it, you just uh, feel uh, uh, discount, uh, uncomfortable and that, then... No, that, that's exactly it. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm relatively scientific-minded and... <clears throat> I, I was noting, I think I want to give the credit to my Tai Chi Chuan practice, but I was noting, noticing that something was different and I couldn't put my finger on it, but something down there, like nothing. And of course I thought, well, maybe I ate something. And I don't remember eating something like, you know, like seafood that was bad or something. And then a few days passed and I was still feeling it. So it, I don't think it was something I ate. And, then I thought, could it be a muscle pull? I don't think so. Could it be like a deep muscle that I'm not used to? And maybe there's something. No, it's not that. And I, and I started charting everything. And what I noticed is that I, I'm a very much a language person. And like, it, it's very, very important to me to get exactly the right word and c convey it at exactly the right time to my students. And I couldn't describe what this sensation was, which was a little troubling because that's my thing. Uh, and so I had the title of my note, you know, where I was writing everything down on my on my computer 
was indistinct medical issue, which is very unsatisfying to me. That, and eventually I just said, let me see my doctor. Let me call up and I can't even explain why I need to see them because I, I don't know <laughs> what the issue is. And I just told her, I said, look, it's something indistinct. It's not exactly pain. It's not, it's just more of a discomfort, but it's just slight, but there's something that's not me. And she said, how do you know? And I said, well, there's no real symptoms. There's not like I'm using the bathroom differently or can't sleep or whatever. It's just something's off. So she said, let's go get a, a colonoscopy, which I recommend everybody do. And, you know, that's when they found it. They said, yeah, this is, you have cancer and it's very obvious and all the rest. So I feel, you know, like that Tingjin practice that's so important to us in Tai Chi Chuan is what brought this to everybody's attention. Well, in case you know, some of you uh, do not practice Tai Chi Chuan and uh, you miss uh, the, the word uh, Sifu Watson was talking about Ting Jing. Ting, uh, Ting Jing is a Chinese uh, term. Ting means listen. Ting is your energy. And uh, so, so I guess uh, uh, Steve Watson, uh, he was, uh, uh, how should I say, push him and a champion multiple times, right? And then mm -hmm. so it, in, in push him, it is very important. We, will be, we should be able to not only listening to our own energy, we also have to sense our opponent's energy. So, yeah. so how to listen, the, the energy and the thing is very, very important and uh, wow. And then this really um, comes in handy, right? So you, you, you understand what's going on. Not say you know what's going on, but you know something is wrong within your body. Yeah, I, and by, something by listening to your body, listening yeah. to your body. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And in push hands, just like in doing uh, Tai Chi as a therapy for somebody else, like Tui Na or something, that's what you're doing. You're, you're, you're learning to extend that listening into somebody else. And push hands, I'm extending the listening into the other person and then like letting them know they were off balance. And in like Twina, for example, you're listening, you're extending your listening into them and then helping to draw them back to balance. But the methodology, I think, is the same. I'm always using that listening skill, that cultivated skill of listening to reach into the being, reach into the relationship, reach into the other and perhaps you know, reach into the world, you know, um, and I didn't know why I was doing that. I just knew, oh, some, I spend a lot of time here in my practice and some things mm -hmm. off. Yeah. Understand. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, okay. And then, um, so you, you had a, it already master size and I guess it's, uh, it's uh, more serious. And uh, so, so you went through the, the long, um, process and, uh, as, you mentioned uh, previously to me, you you had a chemotherapy and you had a surgery. Uh, right? Yes, and then... chemotherapy was the sort of first strategy to to begin to address it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so how uh, what what was your first reaction when the doctor told you that you have cancer? Well, my my first reaction was that. It was the, the colonoscopy doctor. He put his arm around me and he said, look, uh, I was just in there and it's not for me to say, because I guess they send it to somebody else. And then my doctor lets me know the results. And he said, look, I know what I saw. You have cancer. That's not my job to tell you. Somebody else will call you tomorrow. But I just want to let you know, I, I've been doing this for a long time. I know what it was. And so my kind of first thought was that, <clears throat> That's very nice of him to bring the bad news that he didn't have to bring. It, it felt very compassionate and maybe risky. I don't know. So it, it felt kind of, I, I, I was really just kind of empathetic to his situation that he chose to share that with me instead of like make mm -hmm. me wait a day or two or I, however long it might take. Um, but I just thought, okay, I don't really know what this means. I've never had cancer before. Uh, so this should be exciting to find out uh, what I can learn. 
<laughs> okay, I am sorry. <laughs> You, 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 the word you just used, exciting. I, I don't know if anyone else will will, 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 will use the same word to describe the, the that uh, uh, situation. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, so. I, I I feel like uh, you know none of us know you know when we're gonna pass away. None of none of us know if we're gonna get hit by a bus tomorrow or you know whatever might happen. And, you know, having somebody tell you you have cancer uh, is really just telling you that they have a, a, a better set of statistics uh, available to make an argument about when you're going to go, but they still don't know when. So to me, it's just like any other day. The day before, I didn't know when I'm going to die. And today, I don't. I just know that there are people that can make a better bet about when I'm going to die, but nobody knows. What, what I do know is I have today and now I get to learn about something new, like, like, okay, I haven't been down this road. I'm going to meet some really, some real experts, of course, like all, all the medical who I wouldn't ordinarily meet. And maybe I can learn some interesting things. And that was my thinking, you know? Um, so what did you learn after two years, a year and a half? <clears throat> well, you know, I learned a lot about, um, individual people in in the profession a bunch of different you know janitors and nurses and doctors and assistants and radiation technologists and all that kind of stuff um which i always find is one of the most beautiful parts about what we get through this practice of tai chi and qigong um we tend to come to it for a variety of reasons like self-defense or health or better balance these sort of things but one of the big takeaways is like the community that we develop, the, the people we get to know, those bonds. And, you know, for me, a big part of it was just meeting all these people who are dedicating themselves to helping people that are not their family. Um, so I think that that was a that was a big part. I probably learned a bunch of biology and science and that, <laughs> that sort of thing, which is very interesting. Um, but I didn't want to do any of it by you know, reading a bunch of papers or, or trying a bunch of different strategies. Uh, you know, people say, take these mushrooms and do that and take this supplement. And I didn't want to chase that. My my initial thought was when I, and then I told my doctor this when I talked to them, I, I probably the next day, I don't remember now. But I said, look, you know, um, what I've learned on this earth in the time I've been here is that fighting doesn't get us anywhere. That's something I teach in my Tai Chi Chuan, you know, and I, I make a practice of teaching nonviolence. And I said, I am not going to fight cancer. I know you're all going to try and sign me up to fight cancer and, and rah, rah, and defeat this thing. But I don't want to bring any fighting into my life. That is not what I've learned. Now, you are an expert at fighting cancer, and I'm willing to give you my body as your battleground, and you can do the things that if you want to think in terms of fighting, I can practice trusting you, which I thought would be interesting for me, but I don't want to be in an oppositional mindset to the cancer. You know, my view is that cancer is just life. It's just another life form in me. Um, and I don't want to be against anything, but I don't think our world is made any better by fighting. Um, so that was my, my thinking is that I'd prefer to struggle, uh, rather than fight. Um, and if I can give over my body as that battlefield to the people who do want to do that fight, you know, the doctors and so forth, that's fine. Um, secondly, I thought that, um, we're all going to die and few of us have a chance to practice dying uh, or take the chance to practice dying, to get good at that thing. That's something we're all going to do, but we don't practice getting good at it. I don't mean being dead. I just the dying. Yes. And, I think the dying part is the hardest. It's most scary. So why yeah. it, we dead. We dead. We don't know a thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If we were in a car accident and then we just pass away and then, and then, yeah, a lot of people were saying, you know, I, I wish I had a heart attack. I just go like this and very easy. 
But the hardest part is right. the dying part. And uh, most people do not want to face that at all. And then, but uh, you yeah. actually uh, sound like you, you, you're not afraid of it at least, right? Yeah, I, 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 I don't know if I'm afraid of it or not. I, I want to say I'm not. It sounds like what wise people say, but I don't feel like I'm living from fear. But I don't know how close I've come to death either. I just know I have cancer. I don't really know. But I thought to myself, if this whole thing seems more likely that I, I'm going to die than it used to and sooner, if I can use this whole thing as a practice of dying, if at the end of it I die, I'll have been dancing with the practice most properly. And if at the end of it, somebody says, hey, you're cured, guess mm -hmm. what? I've practiced, I've actually practiced like a dress rehearsal, this thing that it will happen. So I thought in any case, what I should do is embrace this as an opportunity to practice dying. And, you know, so I, you know, I made a, you know, a video to my students and, and you know, was crying and stuff, but try to get across how I was seeing things and, and what I expected and what I didn't expect and um, my sort of strategy through this. Um, and I, and, and I'm, to, I'm very grateful to, and I'm still in the middle of it, we're still on it, but I feel like um, I'm more practiced at dying, which by the way, looks very much like practicing living. <laughs> okay. and. Um... Well, so you want to talk a little bit about a so-called practicing dying? How how does that looks like? And uh, you know, mm. I, I practice living, and uh, I know you know every day. I not ne necessarily I have a goal or whatever. I don't do that anymore since I'm so old. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't do goal setting. You say New Year resolution? No, no, I don't do that. But more or Me less, neither. I kind of saw the you know what I want to do. And then I, I have, uh, um, you know, s certain things that uh, I'm, I'm just just carry out, right? And uh, so that's kind of a living, uh, practicing living for me. So when you're mm -hmm. practicing dying, what, what do you do to, to really, what, what do you actually practice? Yeah, well, in, in, in... In the, the moment to moment practice for me is uh, recognizing that I don't have the usual control over things that I've come to expect to be under my control, which is made very clear when you're in the hospital, right? You can't even go to the bathroom without somebody coming to help and all the rest of it. Or, and you can't get yourself a glass of water unless somebody says it's okay and then brings it to you. And, um, kind of starting to pierce through that veil of any sense of actual control in your life, which I think life tends to affirm that we have control and recognizing that ultimately we don't, but not being in conflict with that, which is what the practice looks like. And just say, I, I still have my intention. I still have my preference, but I don't have a goal and I don't believe that I have mm -hmm. control, uh, but I can have influence and in order to influence things, it requires us, here we go with Ting Jin again, to listen to the way that they are moving, the way they are changing or flowing or what somebody is saying and understand and receive that and then offer some influence to it so I can maybe steer a little bit towards a preference, but recognizing that that's imperfect and I don't get a sense of control, I, I might offer like a vote i might offer a little bit of influence to something and um that that allows you to freely participate in the process of change um which might be dialogue or discussion or what have you without being attached to the outcome um which of course if it's we're talking about dying you, you don't <laughs> you don't get to uh decide the outcome uh, whether it happens or when it happens or perhaps how it happens. Um, so, th so that's a very kind of freeing process. Um, so is uh, that, um, so you, in other words, so you are preparing yourself for the death. But yeah. at the same time, I also heard another things, uh, 
kind of liberating. You say you are freeing yourself, and I see yeah. that there, there, there's a, a attitude a difference, right? And there's a different mindset. And uh, is that true? Yeah, yeah I, I think that I think that's fair. Um, as a martial artist, it's it's very. I get, at least for me, it's been very easy to develop a sense of self-confidence around, hey, you know, I can throw the kick and throw this person and fight two people and do the sword, you know, all that kind of martial artsy cool stuff. And um, all of that is about control on some level. And it might simply be controlling your balance and it might be controlling the, the sword and it might be controlling your, you know, your opponent, let's say. Uh, I remember once um, I was teaching at a workshop out in Arizona, um, you know, a bunch of people from around the world came to teach and there was uh, three of us sort of teachers running the thing. And I got in a late a late night argument with my teacher who was there, um, who's very, uh, very smart and very uh, wise and very uh, rebellious and adamant, you know, like a good arguer. And, and Who's he's your my, teacher? Who's uh, your teacher? Don, Don Miller, Don Ethan Miller. Oh, okay. And, and we, we, he's out of Boston. And um, I... <laughs> the argument was over the idea of surrender and i said to him i think that there it, are a number of important lessons to learn around the idea of surrender i don't think it's the only thing but i think there's a lot to be learned and we should open ourselves to uh, that and make a study of it and he would have like none of that um he's very much a you know a 60s uh you know protester and and you know fight the powers and all that which is great we need that in the world but we had a real kind of break there where he couldn't see my side of things at all and i i just wanted to say look there's another there's not just um self-defense and fighting for yourself and standing up for yourself i think there's something to surrender and i think for me the practice of dying is like can i actively participate in the process of surrendering not because something is going to be taken away from me but because i'm choosing to release it right so, so there's very interesting choice. It's not yeah. just saying I surrender once it's been taken. Mm -hmm. It's actually giving it up. Um, and that's not an easy process, but it does help you identify where you're holding on to things. And some of those things are just expectations. They're not actual things. But I did notice, you know, you know in my studies that you know, um, anger is only born of frustration and frustration is only born of expectation. And so in setting down um, expectations through surrender practice, it feels to me like there's no avenue to anger if you don't start with expectation, right? And that's not to say every expectation ends in anger, but- Very all... logical and very philosophical philosophical yeah. very good yeah yeah so to me that was very productive and that, that's a very very helpful thing and luckily my students were on board with it and they were interested in learning what i'm now interested in teaching and they're not just saying hey i want to learn the jumping kick today as well i'm not going to be teaching the jumping kick today we <laughs> here's here's what i'm interested in here's what we can do uh and everybody stayed with me so that was that was pretty beautiful that's, yeah, very, very nice. Your students stay with mm. you. And uh, even when you were in hospital, were not able to teach. Mm. And uh, that's, that just shows uh, your character and how much they, mm. they appreciate you. They love you. And I oh. remember um, um, how we first met. We met at a Tai Chi Gala. And uh, for right. some of you, if you're not familiar with it, Tai Chi Gala is a... a um, a very nice uh, event uh, hosted by Sifu um, Loretta okay. Warring in memory of uh, Master Zhou Zhonghua and I was trying to carry his tradition. And uh, so the, the, the setting was, you know, uh, she invited many of the instructors there to teach, but I think uh, we, we also learn from each other and the very nice yeah. sharing sharing environment, right? And um, 
So uh, one of the things uh, Stephen would do uh, at Tai Chi Gala, besides do, teach him push hand and some other martial arts, and then uh, he would read Dao De Jing. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, uh, early, uh, uh, Sifu Watson and I, we had a little bit of conversation and he was telling me, he was searching for some answer around the age 10 or something, <laughs> somewhere around there. And yeah. then finally, he kind of find the, the answer in library from Dao De Jing, the book Dao De Jing. And the Dao De Jing is... Uh, um, a book written by Sage and uh, Lao Tzu. Uh, Lao Tzu actually is a way, a respectable way we, we call him, him we address oh. him. He, his real name is Li. Uh, he lived about uh, 2,500 years ago in a warring uh, stage in China. So, and uh, he, at his retirement, and uh, he was asked to write down, uh, you know, what he thinks and about the word and his value and, and so forth. So he just in one setting, uh, sitting, sitting, yeah. Sitting, in one wrote sitting, 81 poems. Yes, he, he wrote uh, 81 chapters. And uh, like uh, Stephen said, they are poems and, uh, and uh, to talk about uh, his view of the universe and the life, et cetera. So <laughs> at the age 10 or 12, and uh, you already discover uh, Lao Tzu and discover the uh, Tao De Jing. So, so the, do you think that your attitude of uh, saying, you know, uh, accepting uh, the death or practicing death has anything to do with Lao Tzu's philosophy? Yeah, probably has everything to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, you know, maybe one of the primary arguments that we see in Taoist philosophy, not to restrict ourselves to Lao Tzu, but to include Chuang Tzu, for example. Oh, yeah. Um, Chuang Tzu is my favorite. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I tell people that you should meet Lao Tzu as soon as you can, but wait until your drinking age to meet Chuang Tzu. It's, it's, it's a little bit more fun. <laughs> well, I mean, to me, Lao Tzu is because it's a, there are poems, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. And then um, it's it's hard to understand, and sometimes mm -hmm. you know it depends on how people interpret it. It's I, I have read several versions, you know, um, yeah. by Chinese and uh, how they interpret it. They're a little bit different, and uh, but Zhuangzi is much easier because he used fables and uh, stories, and uh, yes. so so yes, the you Zhuangzi <clears throat> is really fun. Yeah, oh, sorry for Quite interrupting fun. you. No, that's I, I to be interrupted by you know Taoist classics is great. That's fantastic. I think you know one of the the, the sort of basic ideas is that um, we that we don't learn to see the yin yang as oppositional. Like I don't use the term opposite when I describe them. I say they're differentiated. They're varied. One gives birth to the other, and they're dancing. And dancing is not a description of conflict, but there's a, you know, there might be some friction, there might be some, some interplay, but it's not a story of conflict. It's a story about dancing with change. It's a story about um, uh, learning to swim across the river in, um, in awareness of the current. And so that you adapt your, efforts in the world after having listened to the world to try and influence in the direction of your preference. But overall, it's about taking care of everybody and everything, not just taking care of your own greed or want or desire. Um, and, you know, how that pertains to death, I think that, you know, Lao Tzu doesn't tell us what will happen after we die the way somebody that uh, a religious teacher might he just mm -hmm. says we can't know we can see that the state of knowing has passed just like we can't know what came before and we can just say that there is an absence of information that came from before and we might call that way mm -hmm. but 
it, it is not something that we can address, right? In, mm -hmm. in the same way that the Tao Te Ching starts by saying, hey, I'm going to tell you some stuff about the world. And the first thing I want to tell you is that uh, the, the name Tao is not the thing I'm trying to describe. In <laughs> fact, words, the words are not accurate. But I'm a poet, and so I'm going to give you 80 more, more, more poems. Because even though words can't do it, that's my tool. And um, we often, I think, find ourselves with imperfect tools. But I think the wisdom is relatively perfect. But our tools are less than perfect. And so we, we have to learn how to do our best with pure intention, imperfect tools, imperfect understandings. And our best is not designed to serve ourselves. Um, is yeah. designed to serve others, you know, to serve the world. And to me, that's the highest call of teaching. Well, I, I, I'm so glad that you, you mentioned about, so a lot of time people uh, say yin and yang, or yin tai chi chuan practice uh, solid and emptiness. And, uh, yeah. and some sure, people sure. thought that, yeah, they, they thought it was a duality. But actually, they are. This is. Uh, they not really say that comfort was each other, and then you just explained it very well. And this Thank reminds you. me, uh, American um, a, a theologian and also a philosopher, and Thomas Merton. He Thomas Merton. Uh -huh. Yes, and uh, he interpreted and uh, you know the the yin and yang. They are not a uh, you know in comfort with each other they are complementary of each other so very nice yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and i further i would say and you might appreciate this we're familiar with the the um old story of uh chan Tan Fang, uh uh creating tai chi chuan right so so the short version unless you want to tell it um the short version <laughs> is that chuang says uh 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 Sun Chen Feng is uh, meditating, of course, because he's some sage monk guy. And uh, when he wakes up, he sees a crane and a snake fighting. And he says, ah, I have it, the perfect martial art. I'm going to combine these moves with the moves from the snake and we'll have the best martial art. Everybody loves that story. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to hear what you say. Of course, it's, there are some other people also disagree. That's a yes. um, that's another story. But I, I want to hear your 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 I, your, your I think I think that the crane represents heaven, right, or the sky, or yang. the The snake represents the earth, yin, right, and I think San San Fang, if indeed this happened, was speaking metaphorically. Sure, he was meditating better than any of us, and he had perfect. <laughs> no, no, not necessary. He he was yeah. a legendary yeah. person. Uh, okay, figure. Yeah. Some people that some people argue he, he, he was a legendary figure, but yeah, but yeah. I'll yeah. just I'll assume he was in a beautiful cave in a perfect mountain in a beautiful <laughs> meditation, in a perfect mudra. That that's all fine, and I think that his insight, and I might even say his uh, enlightenment was that he saw that the world is yin yang, is mm -hmm. sky and soil, it's it's bird and and snake. And what he saw was that they were dancing together. And that was the generation of Tai Chi Chuan, which is the perfect interplay of these two things. But what we prefer is a story of the two of them fighting and maybe to the death and cool martial arts move came out of it. And I think what he <laughs> is metaphorically i see that what the world is is the interplay the dance of these two energies which in his story is represented by a a crane and a snake but i think that the operative word there is dance not fight and so there is no conflict there's one well, dancing well yeah the that's a, that's a very interesting perspective and then you uh, previously mentioned during the, uh, your your um, well you, you say still in the the treatment and uh, of the cancer and then you have learned a lot and you're talking about some of the the science things and you learned about the the, the medical system you you know our um, uh, healthcare professionals and uh, 
did you learn anything about yourself? Well, that's it. Wow, that's a good question. Did I learn anything about myself? Uh, I I don't know that I learned anything that's a, a it's a big headline, but I feel like my ongoing learnings, which is what I feel like my life has been, were not suspended, and I don't feel that they were improved or there was a, a magical eureka moment either i feel like it's just the same as it's always been which is to say i'm constantly learning about myself and through the lens of myself learning others and through learning but, uh, others but not no yeah so uh in a way yes and uh, uh many of us we, we learn you know about ourselves but anything you know um different and anything, yeah, uh, then what's before, well, oh, maybe the reason I I asked that question because I found, you know, yes, I, every day I learn something about myself, but pretty much like on the same line and I just uh, go a little bit deeper or whatever. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you have the epiphany moment say, oh, actually, that's also part of me, and which I did not uh, know that. Yeah, I didn't know I didn't have, uh, I mean, I might remember differently later, but at the moment, I don't think there was any epiphanies. I don't think, I don't, I don't think that having cancer or, you know, having treatment or having surgery or being in the hospital, any of these sort of things has kind of radically altered and like, oh, now I get it. Like, I just feel like, oh, yeah, I, I, I've been learning how to live. And if these uh, understandings are, are something like truth or accurate, they're going to sustain me through the rest of this process. And I don't have to switch. And like, I didn't like have to stop smoking or start eating healthy or something like that. And, like, I was trying to do all the right things all along. And I feel like those should apply now through this process. So for me, um, it, it, there weren't radical changes, but they might have appeared radical to people on the outside looking in and saying, oh my God, I can't believe you're doing that. And I said, well, this is what I do every day. This is, this is not new. Um, so for a long time in the hospital, I didn't have anybody coming in to do any sort of physical therapy. I, I was just, I felt like I was, just kind of left there while they worry about all the systemic problems that I'm having. And I thought, well, I'm, what Tai Chi can I do from here? Or what Qigong can I do from here? And it started with kind of moving my toes and ankles because I couldn't see all the, you know, catheters and tubes and, and wires. And I, I didn't want to, you know, break <laughs> or pull something out. Yeah. I didn't have a sense of where I could move. So I figured, well, I don't want to bother anybody. Um, but eventually I figured out how to get up. And that's when I learned that my bed had an alarm. So it must have been three in the morning. And when I got out of the bed, the alarm went off because I guess that lets them know if I fell out of the bed or something. And everybody came running in. And I said, oh, no, I'm just, you know, they came in and I was just you know, do my Tai Chi with the, the IV and, and, and stuff oh, like that. That's so, uh, so neat. Yeah, so yeah. eventually they learned that I was going to try and get out very early in the morning before all the hubbub of the hospital started so I can get some practice and some teaching in. Um, because my, my plan was to make every interaction um, uh, um, humane, every interaction humorous, and every interaction, if I could, if the first two were solved, then to try and learn something. So, so you can you were even joking when you were in hospital. Yeah, yeah I, I remember <laughs> early on when I first met my oncologist. There was a pretty extended meeting, like over an hour in the office, but there was other offices, other uh, exam rooms and stuff, and we were laughing so much in that initial hour, you know. Oh my god! That other people asked us if we could tone it down because they're doing very serious things. And I said, look, I, you know, I'll tone it down if you like, that's fine. But um, I'm being serious about the laughter too. Like I'm being serious. I'm not, I'm not uh, out of touch. Like I'm just, I'm just living my life. 
and we found some funny things and so we're laughing so yeah I'd, I'd be laughing all, all the way through um the only thing i haven't really done is fajin chuan since the surgery because you know they cut me open and i have hernias from that and i feel like the internal pressure is not compatible with how my abdomen feels <laughs> so yeah. I, I don't do that practice uh now but maybe down the road i will i, I don't know very nice yeah <laughs> well um one thing i can say is um you know everywhere <laughs> you are at just always laughter oh yay, yay. yeah yeah i i i, I just uh, truly enjoy that uh you know that Oh, how should I say? Be with you. <laughs> yeah, oh, thank it. you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's an mm -hmm. it's an ease of heart. You know, I, it's very easy to take ourselves too seriously, and I think that for a Taoist, um, when they are at play, that is them being at work. Uh, uh -huh. And and I can take very seriously the laughter, and I can. Uh, uh, address very serious topics, which I do with my students all the time. But, you know, laughter f seems to me to lubricate the soul. And uh, it's, it's an important way to, to do it. Um, when I when I go to workshops, often people are, you know, they want to repeat the whole CV every time you're introduced and, and go on and on. And I try and interrupt them and say, look, I'm just Steve. I'm not Sifu anybody. I'm not Mr. Any I'm just Steve. And then I usually bring a stuffed animal with me wherever I go. And that kind of signals to people that he's not going to be very self-serious. Uh, I feel like there's enough for that in the world. Um, even in the martial arts world, there, there can be some haughtiness yes yes <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. so um oh, what i was going to say and uh, you you were talking about um you develop some kind of a Taoism uh things or you use uh, the the Tao Te Ching to to guide you to strategize your your cancer uh, journey is that true or if so and what exactly <coughs> what, what, what uh, it is <coughs> Yeah, so I don't know if it was the Tao Te Ching uh, specifically, although that's certainly part of my my world. And I was lucky enough through COVID to teach a Tao Te Ching course and, you know, work our way through. And, and I wrote a Qigong for each chapter and I wrote a meditation for each chapter. And we brought people through the etymology of the language. And, and uh, oh, so, sorry, yeah. sorry, stop you for, uh, for a second. You say you... You wrote a Tai Chi for each chapter. So are you saying, say, you you select some movement to go along with each chapter? Is that what you mean? Yeah. By that? So yes, yeah, so I, I created a Qigong practice for each chapter. That that would, oh. that would the chapter and How and then a, meditation, then a meditation for each chapter. How need so that people could sort of access more physically uh -huh. than just intellectually the chapters, um, and then you know the class was just a bunch of etymology about uh, to equip people to look at it in, in the original Chinese and through their translations, of mm -hmm. course. <clears throat> and so I was lucky enough to do that. Um, <clears throat> when I went into the hospital, it was an emergency. Um, so I didn't know I was going into the hospital. I was getting chemotherapy and then, uh, then I was in an ambulance and um, they were having trouble with getting my, um, I forgot my blood pressure. They couldn't get, they, they couldn't, uh, I, I, I can't remember what the vitals were that they were challenged by. Oh, the pulse ox they couldn't get, but they could get the pulse. And so everybody looked very worried and there was like 17 people surrounding me. And so I thought, well, I'm on my way to the hospital. I don't know if I'm going to make it to the hospital. And I don't know what this means because I've never been rushed to the hospital, so I couldn't write because everybody's got my arms and they're doing their things. And I thought, well, what's my strategy? So I mapped out my strategy just in my head because I couldn't write it down. And it was all just, here's how I've been living my life. Here's what I teach. How will this apply to what's ahead? And, you know, uh, you know, a big part of that was like, I'm not here to fight. I'm not here to struggle. 
And <clears throat> what I, I know I can do is work to be the best student of any teacher I meet. Um, not that I've ever achieved that, but that's always my intention. Like when I show up, <laughs> I want to be the best student at this class, at this workshop. And I thought I can take that same skill and apply it to every doctor I meet, every nurse I meet, and just say, I'm going to do exactly what you say. I'm going to have the answers that you're going to ask. I'm going to I'm not going to argue and I'll ask a second, a follow up question, I'll, you know, um, and um, recognizing that a big shift for me now, because I'm being rushed to the hospital, is that I'm going to now be in the position of receiving help. Usually I see myself in my life as the person who's giving help. I'm the teacher and people come to me and I have advice mm -hmm. and all the and that's and I feel like I have a skill there and I'm uh, it makes me feel good. Like I like to be able to be in that role of service. And I thought, OK, now my role is different. I'm on the other side of that. And maybe that'll give me a chance to learn what that's like and uh, not have all the the freedom of choice around these things. And, and let me just be receiving and not have any awkwardness or embarrassment or whatever challenges people have. And let me just delight in this role. Um, and so I kind of outlined for myself a list. I, I think it's like 12 or 13 things um, that I said, well, this is the part I can control. I don't know anything about a prognosis or a diagnosis, or I don't know really anything. And I thought I'm not gonna ask any of those questions through the whole process. Um, and I never have. I, I've never asked anybody any of those kind of questions. I don't think that um, getting a sense of, um, you know, what the doctors expect or what the likelihood or statistics or what, none of that's going to help me today. That's just going to put in my brain ideas about tomorrow. And that doesn't help me do what I'm supposed to do today, which is meditate and do my qigong, do my practice, teach if I can. Um, and so I still don't know what the prognosis is or how long something was. I just, I've never asked. And luckily my doctors have never seemed to try and make me know anything like that. Um, and that feels very sensible to me it feels like I'm just even if you only have a two weeks to live it I think that they will tell you <laughs> maybe yeah okay yeah, they, they, they very well yeah. Um, yeah oh yeah but it oh, okay. never even in the hospital I never said how long does this happen how long do we keep doing this or when do I leave or or any I just said what do I do today and that's the part I can affect um um uh, to me, I think one of the important things that we learn in, in the study of the Tao is the, the Tao does not suggest to us goals. It just suggests to us directions, right? So it's what I call the goalless path. Um, where we understand how to reorient ourselves and choose a direction, but it's about the steps that we take on that path. That's what the Tao is, right? It's this path. That's, that's what that character is is the path um and um if i think about where the path leads or where it's supposed to lead or where somebody promised it leads or where i want it to go i i'm gonna trip i, I need to be where i am and it's very simple take this medicine go to this doctor's appointment get get my sleep teach if i'm able to and so forth so actually this is a uh, how should I say? It's very much of our practice, and uh, in a sense, we should be living in the moment. And uh, even though you know you've been diagnosed with cancer, I have not been told I have any, uh, you know, um, sickness at this point. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't right. mean that I will not leave before you, right? Right. There, there right. could we be. Don't several so many different reasons or uh, maybe tomorrow they find i have some problem or um, mm -hmm. whatever so so it's always very important to live in the moment and then so be mindful and be grateful 
and that just like our practice that we always tell our students to 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 live in the moment right and but uh, it is easy for for me or for for a lot of time i'm just teaching people and uh, and uh, when i'm feeling healthy and of uh, you know feel good i can say that but it is so amazing and when you are in the hospital bed and then you still can focus and do the things you care most about, which is humanity and your art. And yes. that's just amazing. That's very amazing. Mm. And yeah. And yeah, and the, the, human, the humanity is that perfect balance of the, of the crane and the snake, of the sky and the soil of yin and yang, mm-hmm. right? That's what we are. We're, we're the two of those. Yeah, but it, it's so easy said than done. When, yes. when we we don't have a pen here, or we don't have tube in uh, right. here and out there, right? It is mm-hmm. so much easier today. But when I'm hearing you and telling me what you you were actually what went through your mind when you were in hospital, and uh, I I think that's that's just incredible, but it, at the same time, I think it, it's uh, extremely uh, wise and intelligent because so many people, they, they, they try, try to get uh, all the statistics, like you say, that the, what's my odds of this and that or whatever, mm-hmm. and they just get themselves so, yeah, worked up and they get themselves really anxious. And uh, uh, was you being say okay if I'm accepting the the, the death and I'm practicing death and I'm still doing things I I am passionate about it and then you actually cut off all those noise which yes uh, affect yeah. you right yes just just cut it out I I, I when a, a doctor or nurse or you know some healthcare professional is there to measure something or take blood or uh, whatever it, exam, I would always just try and be the best patient, like try and you know not complain and be ready and all the rest. Have my notes. I have my notes. I could answer whatever question they had. I know exactly when this started or how long or wh- when I took the medicine. And then once I felt that was satisfied, if you know they're doing what they need to do then i'd look for an opportunity to learn like where did you you know tell me about your daughter or why do you use that type of needle or whatever anything and they would say what nobody asked that and i said well i'm alive and for me that was (laughs) and it doesn't seem like me asking the question right now is distracting anybody you know like and taking too much time but that's going to help me and um this kind of this kind of reminds me i might cry if i tell you this um when you asked me uh did i have any uh, insight or epiphany or something um so something that happened to me during this whole process um which i knew but i realized later that i only knew it intellectually because i had had no opportunity to test it so it didn't it maybe wasn't an epiphany, but I got to experience it as real. And that is that for me, um, I think that you need food, shelter, clothing to live, right? Like the, the, you know, you you need these basic things. Maybe you need social and whatever they are you need. And that's fine. But for me, I need to teach like that is as important as eating and drinking. Like, so I knew that intellectually, but through this process, I had this opportunity to experience the potential loss of that and the challenges to teaching. And, and so I, I got to get this insight like, oh, teaching to me is nutrition. Like this is as important to my being alive mm-hmm. as anything else. And I could feel it when I had an opportunity to teach. And I might be teaching the doctors or nurses something. You know, because they'd come in most of the time if I was awake and I'd be meditating or holding a mudra or writing about the Tao or, you know, writing a poem or something. Or I'd be, you know, waving my hands weirdly because it's Tai Chi. 
And, you know, sometimes somebody would ask, so what are you doing? And I said, well, happy to show you. I'll teach you something. And I could feel like in that opportunity, like, oh, this is one of the legs of the table for me to stand. Like, I need this. Um, and that was that was uh, that was pretty extraordinary to feel uh, and not just <laughs> intuitively know. And now I know why I like you so much. <laughs> the, you know, uh, about four years ago, I moved uh, from St. Louis, Missouri, where I lived for 30 some years to Las Vegas. And um, while I was packing, and I, it, it was very, very, very hard for me because I have um, worked with so many people in St. Louis. And, um, and I'm, and I will be losing my teaching. And yeah. uh, it, it was, it's like a part of me was dying. And that was yeah. very, very, very hard for me. And then that was the time <laughs> I pick up my, my books of uh, Zhuangzi and the Lao Tzu, Tao Te Ching. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a grief practice to, to have. Uh, uh, Yes, and uh, well, yeah. I, I guess uh, it, it, all the experience in life actually um, make us grow. So, so I mean, yes, I, I wasn't practicing the, the physical dying, <laughs> but I also mm. was practicing, um, you know, a big part of me is my, my passion. You know, I felt, you know, it was dying and uh yeah, yeah cuz um, there was the death of that mm. period of your life and like to mm -hmm. to to approach that with some ceremony and some grief and some recognition i think is really important mm -hmm. and difficult you know it's it's when mm -hmm. when i was going through chemo just before the the emergency you know the 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 pivot towards the hospital i was very 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 weak and i more or less crawled to the school Pro probably i walked but i once I got in the school, I crawled and I just laid down on some cushions on the floor. And that was the best I could do. I think somebody must have brought me tea. And I just laid down um, and I kind of whispered to teach the class. And the students would come very, very close to listen. And then they'd go back and they'd practice. And, and, and I felt they're probably not quite getting what they paid for. Like, I'm just <laughs> laying down, whispering, like, very weakly whispering um but it's nice that they're trying and nobody's complaining but i i felt like for me like this is probably more for me than for them the fact that i can have this ordinary hour of teaching instead of dealing with the inconvenience of of the di you know the diagnosis really made it clear to me like this is uh, a, a functional and fundamental element of my being is is to be able to teach you know so is that so, why you you taught from, from the hospital bed of meditation yeah live streaming yeah I, I yeah i felt like once i was able to and i thought the only way i can get this teaching out is to is to live stream it um let me just do that i don't know if anybody will tune in or not but that's what i did and one of the other things is, uh, I think I did, yeah, I did this in the hospital bed. I, I think with my phone, I just sent I love you videos to a number of different people. And I just, I, there was no content. I could just show them, here's the hospital room. I just want to thank you for this and that and make sure you know I love you. And it was mostly a bunch of Tai Chi teachers that we might both know. But I just wanted to let them know, here's how mm -hmm. I feel. I don't know what's coming and I want to make sure that like bill phillips the, the, those sort of people like i'm gonna just send this to you uh mm -hmm. so that we're connected and then uh mm -hmm. uh try and do a teaching so that that was uh that was an important you know process for me very nice well um so for us and we can just keep going talking and talking and talking i enjoyed this so very much fun. Kind of, yeah conversation with you <laughs> Very, very much so. And uh, thank you uh, for, I, I know you, you you just finished a class and then ran to here and, uh, did, and yeah. to, to be interviewed. And uh, so I, I really appreciate this. And uh, 
So, okay, let's keep in touch and uh, have yeah. you back uh, on, on the program again, okay? And the talk Please. other subjects of when you want to, okay? Thank so, you so much. Bye-bye, Fluffy. Love, everybody. <laughs> okay, bye.